Hello, New Day, you all right? It's good to be here. As Stu said, I'm from South East London. Any Londoners in the tent? Yes, good. Uh, go to yeah, King's Church London in a place called Catford, um, which is a beautiful place in the world. Uh, before I start, I wonder, is there anyone in this tent that's ever in their life had a nickname? Make some noise if you've ever had a nickname. Oh, wow. Loads of us. Loads of us have had nicknames. I've had lots of nicknames growing up. My, the main thing I was called, my second name is McNamara. And so in school, a lot of people called me Macca. I was called that for years. But I've been called a host of different names. I've been called Big Mac. I've been called Little Mac. I've been called Mac Attack. I've been called Macaroni. I've been called Mac Banana. I've been called Joey. I've been called Mighty Joe Young. You name it, I've been called it. And uh, I love nicknames. Uh, my favorite nicknames, you might have someone like this, where you don't even actually know their name. You just know their nickname. Or even deeper than that, I love it when you know someone and you go around their mum and dad's house and their mum and dad call them by their nickname. It's like their name is so, I've got a friend, her name is Norris. Um, but her name's not Norris, her name is Naomi. But I didn't know that till about eight months of knowing her. And I went around her mum and dad's house for dinner and her dad calls her Norris. And I love nicknames like that. And the reason I'm talking to you about nicknames is because when you read the Bible, especially the New Testament, Jesus has given loads of different names. They call him Jesus. They call him the Christ. They call him Messiah. They call him Son of God. They call him Son of Man. They call him the Lamb of God. They call him Rabbi, Teacher. They call him the Great High Priest. They call him a whole load of different names. And it's got me wondering a little bit about Jesus, if he was alive today, what his Snapchat or Instagram name would be. I've been thinking a little bit about that. I wonder... If you just go for a simple Jesus Christ, or whether it would say username taken, so he's got to go Jesus Christ 33 or something like that. Anyone ever had that username taken? It's a pain in the backside. And, or whether he'd go a little bit more roadman and go like certified Christ or something like that. You know, whether he'd go man like Messiah or your boy underscore Jesus. I don't know. It, who knows what his Snapchat or Insta would be? I'm sure it would be something pretty special. Uh, the thing about nicknames is whatever you're, usually a lot of nicknames, there's a story behind why they've got that nickname. So I've got a friend, um, I used to have a friend called Bins. And the reason he was called Bins was because when he was about 12, someone put a bin on his head and pushed him over and he fell. And ever since then, he's a fully grown man now, people call him Bins. Uh, there's always like a story behind the nickname. And what I want to do tonight is I want to open the Bible I want to read a section from here, and we're going to talk about a particular name that Jesus has given. We're going to talk about a particular name they called him. It's almost like a nickname, and we're going to look at a little bit about the history of well, why was he given that name? Why, was, why did the writer of the Bible decide to call him that name? And we're going to look at that and kind of see how that applies to you and me. The fact that Jesus has given this nickname, well, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? And how can we respond to God's word? And so I hope you're up for that. Um, I hope you're up for just getting involved with the Bible tonight. Uh, and that's kind of where we're going to go. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to read a section from the book of Hebrews. For those of you that have got a Bible, don't panic, it's going to come up on the screen. Um, so I'm going to pray. Don't you just bow your head with me and we'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you that it's not some old book, 2,000 years old, that uh, we, it's not relevant to our lives today. We thank you that it is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. And we pray that as we open your word tonight, Lord, that we'll be challenged, we'll be transformed, Lord, that we'll respond to you. I want to pray for each of us sitting down here. I want to pray for myself, Lord, that we will meet with you powerfully through your word tonight, that we'll be transformed by your word tonight. And as we come back and continue to sing worship songs to you, Lord, we'll know who we're singing to even more because of what's come out of your word. And the new day said, amen. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted 
in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I'm going to make a quick comment before I talk about that. Stu mentioned it. It wasn't that long ago that I was sitting down here. Uh, I started coming to New Day when I was 12. I'm 24 now. I think that's 12 years. Um, and when I was probably 12, 13, 14, 15, if the people that knew me or you told me that I was going to be here preaching God's word to you, I probably would have laughed. I certainly wouldn't have believed you. I don't think my mum and dad at that time would have believed you or my school teachers or anyone else. But when I was 15, I turned up to New Day, I think it's 2009, and I met God powerfully through the preaching that was happening. I, I met with God powerfully, and my life has never been the same. You know, I, I look back to that day, and everything changed. I went back into year 11, and I was a different person. My mates knew it, my family knew it, my friends knew it. And, and that's the same to this day. And so don't be unexpectant of God doing work in your life uh, through the preaching this week. Don't be unexpectant that God is going to do something in you be prepared to be changed and transformed by his word. And so as we, even as we speak tonight, as we kick things off, um, expect to be challenged and transformed by the word of God. That will be my encouragement to you. We've got three quick verses to look at tonight. I'm going to read each one. I'm going to try and explain a little bit what it means. So verse 14 says this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Back in the day, I'm talking thousands of years before Jesus, it wasn't like it was now. So now we have churches all over the world. Yeah, All over the world there's churches, people of God that worship God in those churches. Back in the day there was one people of God, they were called Israel, and there was one place where God's presence was, that was called the temple. And so the people of God, Israel, would worship God in the temple. And what they would do was every year, the people of Israel, they would gather everyone and they would choose a man from among them to be a representative. They would call him a high priest. So they would, they would pick a man once a year and they're going to say, you're the high priest. You're going to be our representative for us before God. And the way I think of it, hands up if you have sports day in your school. You must do. I'm a school teacher. I teach English. Any English fans in the building? Yes. I'm offering extra tuition in the Riven Factory this week, um, summer school. In my school, sports day is a big thing, and I'm a form tutor. Now, everyone knows that all the events in sports day are important, but we all know it's all about the 100-meter sprint, yeah? It's all about who's got the burners, who's the quickest. So I'm a form tutor, so when it comes to sports day, I sit my form down, and I say, right, let's be real, who's the quickest? About eight of them put their hand up. Everyone thinks they're the quickest. And we kind of have to really decide, now, who are we going to choose to represent us for the 100-meter sprint? And this year, it was a boy called Aaron for the year 8 100-meter sprint. And no surprises, because he's in my form, Aaron won the 100-meter sprint. And he won. And as he's running and he's finished the whole form, the whole house, even, we're going crazy. He's representing us. It's like we're all running with him. He's our representative. He didn't win the 100-meter sprint. We all won the 100-meter sprint. And that's the way that I would kind of compare it. It's a little bit like this with the high priest. Instead of picking someone who's going to run your 100 meters, they would pick someone who's going to represent all of them as the high priest before God. And the high priest's job was quite special. Once a year, once a year, he would have to go into the temple. Now, in the temple, there was a place called the Holy of Holies. Everyone say Holy of Holies. Now, that was very tame. Everyone say Holy of Holies. It's better. There's a place called the Holy of Holies. Now, the Holies of Holies was a place where God's present, presence dwelt. And it was a place that was so holy, like God's presence was so powerful there, so majestic, so glorious, that even going into that room at the back of the temple, if you were just to go in there, you would die. That's how powerful the presence of God was. That you would, you would be slain by even being in there. But what God said is, no, once a year, I'll allow someone to come in there to make a sacrifice to deal with all of the sins of the people, all the wrong things you've done that year, all the things that were against God. Once a year, this man comes in, he makes a sacrifice, and he deals with everyone. He represents all of the people. And what they would do is they would tie a rope around him. 
a tie of rope around him because they weren't even sure that even though he was allowed to go in, there's a risk that just being in the presence of God could literally, he could be slain. So they would literally tie a rope around him so they could pull his dead body out just in case. And that was the job of a high priest. Now, to come back to Jesus, in the same way, in this text, the author calls Jesus a great high priest. And that's the history of the nickname. He's saying in the same way that that high priest represented the people of Israel before God, he's saying that Jesus is our representative for all people before God. Jesus is our representative before God. But unlike the Jewish priest or the high priest back in the day who would do that once a year, this verse says that we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens. That means that Jesus is in the heavens So Jesus, risen from the dead, is in the heavens with his Father. Not representing us once a year on one occasion. He's representing us at all times, continually, daily, every minute of every day. Jesus is our representative before God. So I hope we kind of understand what the high priest means. Now, Now I reckon, I could be wrong. I reckon some of you might be thinking, well... That sounds okay, Joe, but I'm not quite sure I need a, I, I'm not, I don't really think I need a representative. What, what do I need? Why do I need representing? What, what's God representing me for? What's Jesus representing? I don't need a representative. And the word high priest can be a bit confusing. And so I kind of use the word a go-between. Jesus is almost like a go-between between us and the Father. And so the next verse in the passage, I think, kind of explains a little bit about why we need a representative. And so I'm going to read it, and I'm going to kind of try and explain to you about why we need Jesus to represent us. So verse 15 says this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus is fully God. He's in the heavens, fully God. But Jesus lived on earth. We know that. He lived on earth. He was fully man. He left heaven, came to earth, lived about 33 years. And in that time, the Bible just tells us here that he was tempted in every way. And temptation is is a little bit mad. I'm probably, some people are going to wind me up for saying this. But um, I'm getting married in three weeks. Yeah. To a beautiful lady called Sylvia. Uh, and um, we get married in three weeks. And when we started going out, me and Sylvia, uh, I threw a few tests out there. I don't know if it's right or wrong. Maybe it's wrong. I don't know. She was probably testing me at the same time. But one of my tests, right, before, before I explain this, make some noise if you know what Morley's is. Right. For those of you who don't know, Morley's is like a South London thing. It's a chicken shop. And I think I've got a photo of it to come up, actually. Um, let me try and get a photo of Morley's uh, up on the screen, just for education. Morley's is basically a chicken shop where you can get, um, that's the one closest to me, um, the guy in there, he's a good man, boss man. Now, the reason it's good is because you get two pieces of chicken and chips for about two pounds. Or you can get wings and chips. It's cheap. It's very cheap. And it's good food. Well, it's not good food, but it's nice food. Now, me and Sylvia, what I said to her quite early was, I didn't want her to be one of those people who's just materialistic or she wants me to keep spending money on dates. So one time pretty early, I said, you're going to go out for some food? I said, let's grab a Morley's. Just seeing what she would say. And she was like, yeah. I knew from that moment that she was my ride or die. Listen, I knew then that she was the one for me. I thought, you know what, she doesn't need, you know, she doesn't even need KFC. She'll settle for Morley's. Um, now, the reason I'm sharing this is because when we got engaged, we thought we got to stop mucking about with this Morley's thing. Listen, we got, you know, I want to get in my wedding suit. She wants to get in her dress. We want to be on the honeymoon looking in good shape. You know, it's like James Bond and that coming out to sea. So we made an agreement. We're not eating Morley's till we get married. Um, we even thought about maybe having Morley's as the wedding meal, but that got turned down. Um, Sylvia said no. Um, but... Three weeks ago, I was walking past Morley's, 
and I was so hungry. It was uh, the long day. I, I had about 250 on me, and I walked past this Morley's, and anyone who knows a chicken shop, the smell just hit me. It's the chicken, I think it's the wing, they just hit me, and I, I could see it in there. It's like it was calling my name, Joe, come and have some chicken. And, and it was just so tempting. But I had to resist it. I had to just say, you know what, no. And I'm not even joking, I, I kind of half jogged down the road. Yeah, like I just ran away from that temptation. I thought, you know what, this isn't, this isn't my thing. And that's a bit of a silly temptation, those who, who can resist chicken. But my challenge to you, if you know what Morley's is, try and go a year without eating it and then talk to me. That's what, we've, that's what we've done. It's like self-control. It's like testing, spiritual training. Um, now, there's other temptations, ones that are a little bit more serious. Lust, pornography. What are we watching? What are we doing with our boyfriend or girlfriend? How do we interact with others? Do we deceive our parents? How do we respond with teachers at school? How do we treat our mates? Do we go behind their back? There's more serious temptations, things that will draw us further and further away from God. There's more serious things than than eating chicken. And, it's, and the reason I say this is because you have to understand that Jesus was no different to you and me. Jesus, lived here. he would have known the temptation of lust, the temptation of greed, the temptation of telling lies. He would have known Jesus, like all of us, understood what it was to be tempted in every way. And that is why, because of what he lived on the earth, that he can sympathize with us. Sympathy means to be able to understand where we're coming from. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those scenarios where you're trying to explain something to someone and you just get frustrated and you're like, you just don't understand. Usually it's when you're talking to your parents. Like you're trying to explain something to them. And you're like, I remember being young and my mum was trying to get me a pair of trainers and they were rubbish. But she was coming with the mum lines, they're strong and sturdy and they will last a long time. And I'm like, yeah, mum, but I'll get wrecked when I put them on for PE. Like, is that real? And I come and say, mum, you don't understand. Sometimes it's silly things like that, but sometimes it's serious things. Like there's things that you're going through at the minute, temptations you're facing, troubles you're facing. That I don't understand that people, you feel like your friends don't understand, that your parents don't understand. These things that are blocking you from getting to God. Like you said, it might be some of the things we've mentioned. But the Bible says Jesus was tempted in every way. And he understands. He felt the tug, the pull, the draw of sin throughout his life. But he never, ever, ever gave into it. He always had power over it. He was the holy high priest. He never sinned. He was without sin. And we can't skim over that verse. He was without sin. It's the foundation of the passage. It's the foundation of what it means for him to be a high priest. Because me and you... Whether you know it or not, we've all sinned. The Bible gives us clear instruction. All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have fallen short. You know when I explained to you about the temple, that in God's temple that he's so, in the holy of holies, say holy of holies, you awake? Holy of holies. In the holy of holies, God is so, his presence is so powerful. He's so holy. God is so majestic. He's so righteous that, that our sin is so offensive to him. Your sin is offensive to God. My sin is offensive to God. So much so that the Bible, again, it says clearly that actually the wages of sin, the punishment for sin is death. Those who sin, what we deserve is death. And all of us have done that. And so that is why we need representing. In the book of Isaiah, it says, your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. The sin that you and I have committed, the things that we've done, the things that no one knows about, the things we've said and fought and watched, all of these things, they've separated us from the Father. They've separated us from God because of our sin. And so God, in his love, sends his son Jesus, the great high priest, a go-between, his son, He takes on human flesh. He lives a perfect life without sin, as it says. And then he dies and takes on the sin of you and me. And then he rises again. I'm going to talk about that. But before he did that, Jesus made it clear. He said, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to God, the only way to the Father is through me, is if I'm your representative. That's the only way to get to God is through Jesus. 
And so when God looks at us, when God looks at you and me, the Bible talks about how his, people have described it as a great exchange. That he no longer sees us. When we follow Jesus, God looks at us and he sees his son. It's almost like you've got Jesus over here. His perfection, his sinless life, his righteousness. And over here you've got us, our guilt, our wrongdoings, our sin, our rubbish. And Jesus, literally, when he dies on the cross, he gives us his perfection and his righteousness and his sinless life. And in exchange, he takes our rubbish. He takes our guilt and our sin and our shame and he takes it to the cross. And that's what Jesus does. You have to understand this, you really do, that without Christ, without Jesus, we have no access to God. Absolutely no access. We are eternally separated from Him. We are left to perish. We are destined for hell without Christ. But with Jesus... It is a whole different story. It's a completely different story. With Jesus, actually the next verse in our text tells us what we get. Because when we have Jesus involved in our lives, when we're involved with him, that we don't perish, we don't go to hell, we don't, uh, we're not separated from God, we don't receive judgment or guilt. That's not what happens. We actually, we get an invitation. You receive an invitation. And the next verse of these three verses is the invitation that you get. And I'm going to read it. And I'm going to explain it. This is the invitation that you get when you accept Jesus. Approach God's throne of grace with confidence. So that you may receive mercy and find grace to help you in your time of need. I'm going to read it again. Approach God's throne of grace with confidence. So you may receive mercy and grace. To help us in our time of need. When Jesus is your great high priest, when he's your go between, the throne of God, that might confuse you. The Bible talks about how God is sitting in the heavenly realms on a throne, ruling from his throne. What does it mean, the throne? That's what it means. And Jesus is sitting at his side. And if without Jesus, that throne, is a throne, sorry, with Jesus is a throne of grace. It's not a throne of judgment. You will find mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. Jesus has met your need for forgiveness. And I want to explain it like this. Is anyone here, just hands in year 11, just finished year 11. Quite a few of us. Right. Anyone in year 7? Yes. When I was in school, there was a, a top playground. And above the top playground, there was a cage. Now, that cage was open to all year groups. But everyone knew that was the year 11's cage. I don't know if you've got a spot like that in your school that that's like the year 11 spot. And you don't go there unless you want to get rushed, unless you want to get, you know, your ball nicked, unless you want to get a little beaten or pushed around. You don't go there. And that was the cage in my school. It was the year 11 zone. But me, being year 7, being about this big, Decided, I got a brand new football one time. My brother got it for me. It was one of those Champions League balls, footballers will understand. And I thought, no, you know what? The cage is the environment to go and play with that ball. There was little goals in there. I thought, I'm not, listen, I'm not having it from these year 11s. So I said to a couple of my friends, I felt a bit brave. I got some courage. Now, boys, listen, let's go to the cage. We'll just tell them chill. So they're looking at me like, oh, it's Joe going off again. I said, no, come on, it'll be fine. They must know who we are. We walk up to the cage, I've got my ball in my hand, and it was a, as soon as I enter the cage, literally, I've got one foot in the cage. A boy who I knew called James was year 11, I said I knew him, he lived in my area. I come running, I'm holding my ball. He punches the ball from under my arm, it hits my chin, I bite my lip, it bursts. He pushes me into the cage, takes my ball and runs off. And so I did what a tough boy from South East London would do. I cried. And I run and got my older brother, who was in year 13. Yes, you know. And I didn't just get my older brother either, I got him and about four of his mates. 
A couple of them were big guys as well. So I said, Sean, it's my brother's name. I'm crying, I've got blood on my lip. I said, oh, James, in my football. In my football. Sean. My brother comes marching up to the cage with me. Obviously, I'm behind him. Yeah, it's going down. <laughs> my brother gets there. He sees James at the other side of the cage. Before my brother even gets there, James's face, whoo, it's like he booed himself or something. I'm not even I think he did. And my brother comes to him and he, he grabs his shirt like this and says, and then this boy, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He gives the ball back. I didn't know he was your brother. He gives the ball back. My brother dashes him. We get the ball and we walk back off. I felt like the king. Listen, you know it the next day, me and my friends, I approached that cage with confidence. I walked up that cage, I walked to it, and I thought, this is my domain now. And it's funny because I've been thinking about that story when I thought about this passage. Because my ability to go to that cage, it had nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with who I was, or how special I was, or how tough I was. Literally, it had nothing to do with me. It was because of who my brother was. It was because of what my brother had done. It was because of the victory that my brother won over James when he grabbed him. That's why I could go to the cage. And you know what? It's the same with this. Because we can approach the throne of God not because of who we are, not because of what we have done, not because we're special at all, but because of who Jesus is, because of what Jesus has done. Because, because Jesus didn't win a victory over James. Jesus won a victory over death. Jesus, when he hung on the cross, said three words that changed the course of history. He said, it is finished. He declared it, and then he went to the grave, and three days later, he rose again, and he defeated death. He crushed on the skull of Satan. He said, it is finished. And he defeated the power of sin. He defeated the power of death. And so because of Jesus, because of what he has done, and because he represents us, we can approach the very throne of God. Completely free from any guilt, completely free from any condemnation, completely free from any judgment. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you think about yourself. Now, Joe, you don't know about me. You don't know where I'm from. Oh, listen, I don't, but Jesus knows. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter how your last year has been, how your last few weeks have been, how the last 16, 17, 18 years of your life have been. When we approach God's throne, knowing that Jesus is our representative, when we come before God, we recognize the sin in our lives and we repent of it. And we say, God, you know what, I want to turn away from that. I want to turn away from the things I've been doing. I want to turn away from going against you. I want to repent of all of that stuff. And I want to turn, I want to follow you. And when we do that, the invitation is there for all of us. When we follow Christ, when we're with him, we have access to the Father. And let me tell you this. When you have access to the Father, it's greater than anything else you can ever know. And I experienced it here. The things that got me going used to be things of the world, trainers and, and girls and music and money. And those were the things that I thought were exciting things. Those were the things that I thought were worth living for. But when you come through Jesus to know the Father, you realize those things are worthless. Those things are nothing compared to the glorious riches of knowing Christ. And so tonight, the invitation is open to each of us here. Christ invites us again to come and follow him, to allow us to have him as our representative. He says, let me represent you before the Father. We have to follow him. It's like a two-way thing. He wants to be our representative. He loves us. He, he wants to be with us. He wants a relationship with us. But we have to follow him. We have to turn away from our sin. We have to acknowledge, actually, yeah, I need you, Jesus. I can't get to the Father without you. And so tonight we're going to do that. We're not going to wait until tomorrow. We're not going to wait till day four. Listen, I know what it's like at New Day. I've, I've been there. You come to New Day last year, and for the month after New Day, you're buzzing. You're reading your Bible. You're listening to worship music. But it kind of fades away. And you come to New Day again, and this first meeting is a bit weird. You're thinking, ah, oh, I feel a bit... I feel a bit bad, I feel guilty because the last year, I've not really been living for God that much this year. I kind of haven't really been reading my Bible or praying. I've kind of been doing this and that. And we can kind of take a few days to warm up. 
The Bible doesn't say approach the throne of grace in three days. It's not what it says. Approach it now. And so tonight, that's what we're going to do. And so I'm going to invite, I'm going to ask the band to come back up just now. And what we're going to do is we're going to respond to God's word. You're not responding to me. Don't be mistaken. You're responding to God's word. And I hope it's challenged you. And I hope you've realized who Jesus is, why he has that nickname, and why we can worship him. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. We're going to worship Jesus. We're going to respond to him. So what I actually want you to do in a moment is to all just stand. But as, I, as you do that, I don't want us to... Uh, get lost in the noise of standing up. I want you just to do so very quietly. In fact, as we respond to God's word, I'm telling you, let's, let's stand very quietly. Do that now for me, please, and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray, and then Simon and the band are going to lead us. If you feel comfortable, why don't you just close your eyes? Maybe bring your hands before God, a sign of just showing you open to him and what he's doing. And I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the work that Christ has done. We thank you that because of him, it is finished. We thank you that he defeated death. He defeated sin. That he was without sin. And because of him, we can come to you. Because of him, we have a gateway to the Father. Because of him, we can come into your presence. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence and I pray for each of us now I pray for each of us now that we would come and receive your grace receive your mercy come Spirit of God come Jesus